The following is meant for entertainment and educational purposes. It is not meant to establish a doctor-patient relationship. Please consult your mental health provider for your mental health needs. Hello, welcome to Sheikh my home where we talk about psychiatry and religion with a focus on how to apply it to your life. And I am Dr. Eric. I'm a psychiatrist who happens to be religious, and I'm trying to create this space where we can have a nice conversation about psychiatry and religion to hopefully enrich your life. This series is the William James series on the varieties of religious experience because it's fairly important to understand the religious experience from the guy who kind of wrote a lot about it. And we're going through lecture number 10. 10 out of 20, so I guess we're at the halfway point. Yay! And the conversion process, uh, we, we talked about that last time in lecture 9, and he will be continuing on with conversion and kind of talk about the implications of conversion overall. Lecture 9 talks about the basics of what is conversion, and now Lecture 10 is going to be talking about what the implications of what we're going in. He kind of goes into more details about the psychological aspects of conversion. So let's begin. William James starts off, of course, with examples of uh, famous examples of conversion processes, and he goes through them. But then he begins to start talking about different uh, types of Christianity and their views of conversion. Uh, don't quote me on this, but he says that Protestant and Catholics, they say Christ's blood, the sacraments, and the individual's ordinary religious duties are enough for salvation. There does not need to be an acute crisis of despair and surrender, followed by relief, according to the Protestant Catholics, according to William James. And William James points out that Methodist says that unless there has been some sort of crisis or self-despair, um, you have not effectively received uh, the salvation and then Christ's sacrifice is incomplete. That is the Methodist version. Don't quote me on this. I didn't do a thorough review of the different beliefs of the different denominations, but this is what William James is trying to point out, that there's a tension between those who, you know, have had a gradual conversion where they learn about religiosity and it becomes more and more center of their, their understanding of the world, and then those who haven't had or those who haven't had it, and those who have had a great sort of a conversion process where they had a great sort of a despair and crisis moment that made them convert. And those who are, let's say, of the healthy-minded, the uh, once-born, may have a tendency to do the gradual version, you know, a little bit every single day, learn more and more about God. And those that have the twice-born might have had a great crisis moment. And in that crisis moment, they learn about God, and then they may believe that their crisis moment is more authentic to an understanding of God versus the once born. And that is kind of the, um, the, the, the tension between the two, that those that have had crises will look upon those that didn't have a crisis and say, you don't understand what religiosity truly is until you've gone through a crisis. Just wait, and then you'll truly understand, and vice versa, right? Then people who are like just learning stuff are like, hey, like, why do I need to go through a crisis to do this? I'm pretty, things are pretty good, and I really love God very much. Those who, uh, it, it's natural for those who have gone through crisis to believe in miracles rather than a natural process for religious, um, uh, uh, sort of religious conversion. And examples include, you know, hearing voices, or lights being seen, or visions, or as if a higher power is interacting with you directly. So the real question is, is conversion a miracle from God or is it a natural process or is it both? Well, in order to answer this, William James has to go deeper into an understanding of psychology. And previously we talked about this hot, cold concept, this higher priority versus lower priority, this aspect of a center of your, your attention and that's what matters. So now William James wants to introduce an idea where he calls fields of consciousness, all right? And it's a trendy psychology thing that's happening at the time, although we don't really talk about fields of consciousness as much nowadays, but it's an interesting concept. And previously, people believed that consciousness, mental states, were just a series of discrete ideas that people understood, and then they just happen here, and then you happen something here, and you happen something here. But nowadays, we kind of recognize that it's much more complicated than that. And that there are sort of, before we thought that there were like discrete boundaries, but now we realize that there aren't discrete boundaries. It's just this great field of consciousness, and it, it can be very, very wide or very, very narrow. So for example, uh, if I'm thinking about cookies, and I want to eat cookies, my field of consciousness at the time is narrow to cookies. But if I'm thinking about the expanse of humanity and how humanity changed over time, then that would be a wider field of consciousness. 
our mental fields can go from one interest, a center of interest to another center of interest, right? And then they all have their, their margins, like at their, their edges, right? And some, again, fields are narrow and some are wide. And some people are just different. Some people have, you know, a very narrow field of view. Maybe if someone has a more simple life, they just want to view their uh, narrow, uh, narrow field of view of what they just want to worry about their family, worry about the church and not care about anything else. And other people have a wider uh, field of view where they really want to care about humanity as a whole and, and policies and, you know, a government and how humanity should be run. And this is just sort of how the fields of view work. With this field of view concept, it really is hard to find the distinctions between different ideas and concepts and very difficult to find the margins. We know very well what's within the margins by our consciousness. Our, but our past memories that we don't really interact with all the time is kind of at the edge, at the periphery again, you know, of this, of this space. And what is believed to be a matter of consciousness is what we find uh, in, inside this view. But it turns out what happens outside in these margins is really matter as well. So for example, let's say you have an old memory of a childhood. You don't really think about it all the time. But if someone jogs your memory, you don't remember the Christmas and your very, very first Christmas when you got that, you know, present that you really wanted. Oh, suddenly it was in the periphery and then it kind of comes back in your field of consciousness. And so William James wants to point out that understanding the mind, uh, the structure of the mind as having fields of consciousness being wide and narrow, as having priorities and low prior high priorities and low priorities will help us understand the conversion process. So I hope that wasn't too complicated. I hope it also is a bit intuitive, you know, the way that you interact with the world and how you understand your own memories and stuff. And we'll get deeper into it uh, next time. I'll talk to you later. Bye. Oh, do like and subscribe. Talk to you next time. Bye. Hey, how's it going? Check out my new website. It's available now. You can learn more about me. You can also check out some things I'll be offering in the future, webinars, books, and whatnot. It's a fancy website with a lot of moving parts uh, designed by someone who's very, very talented. So check it out when you get a chance. All right, I'll talk to you later. Bye.